obsessively checking out my signal to noise ratio. Uh, I'm lo- no, but that's too high because now it's crazy because at the top of the dial I peak so often and that the it's so. Fuck it, Abe. How are you doing? I'm good. Are we recording? <laughs> Did you just take a sip? The weed's from still burning. Can? Oh no. Don't you Do remember you from college? The etiquette is to put the weed out. I am no longer an etiquette master. Unless and it's I used been to be continuously a teacher. Cherried. You're the first person who ever weeded me. <laughs> yeah, I weeded you. But you didn't teach me the lingo because I'm saying shit like well, you weeded no, me. <laughs> I'm out of my depth now since college. See, I taught you everything you knew, and now I've forgotten everything, and you're reteaching me. So this, the teacher becomes the pupil? The student becomes Indeed. the teacher? Welcome to Frame Rate, the podcast where we rate frames. Yeah, that's what we do here at Frame Rate. Great. Great. Great job. <laughs> hey, man, I'm trying to help you on the introduction. You're always doing introductions. Always doing introductions. That's true. D- are yeah. you jealous? Do you want to hop in and do some introductions? No, I'm not jealous. Why Envious. would it be jealous of you? <laughs> All right. I'm you still low, man. I feel like I got to tweak. Tweak it and restart it. I got to tweak my... No, we're not restarting. Uh, People like this raw behind the scenes. Yeah, that's a good way for You got a raw dog or audience. Exactly. <laughs> Um, speaking of introductions, mm. hey, today we're talking about Saving Private Ryan, 1998, directed by Steven Spielberg. Um, yeah, that's true. D- I feel like, uh, do you think it's worth, we never did in the first two episodes, like, here's uh, what the movie's about, if you haven't seen it. Not Does that really. Does at all? Nah, I mean. What about when we do obscure shit? It seems <laughs> when we like do we obscure shit, the okay. way that I found it is that, because if they're clicking on it. Like, I don't know if there's any dum-dums out there listening right now, but you're like, Saving Private Ryan, I haven't seen that film. Click on that. There's going to be spoilers. So there's no purpose in doing wide broad strokes. But like, for example, if you were to be like, all right, there's this one shot. So you remember at Omaha Beach and there's mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm, happened. Mm-hmm. Say a few mm-hmm. things. So the audience is like, I don't know who Barry Pepper is, but you say, remember the guy's really good at shooting stuff. And they're like, hey, I do kind of he remember looks, that. He's like Giovanni Ribisi if his eyebrows were lower. <laughs> Well, Giovanni Ricci are is in the movie. I know, that's why I made the joke, you mook. <laughs> All right, this podcast is I over. Hate you <laughs> for the listeners at home. Our fists are already in like fisticuff yeah. position where they're slowly rotating. Where does that term come from? Because like you're fisticuffs, fist, fist and cuffs. You roll f- your cuff up so your fist so is like, exposed. Why I, oughta. I assume. Yeah, why I oughta. All right, so we won't synopsize <laughs> Saving Private Ryan. I, I don't hope think you've it's seen necessary. It. Send us an email. I'll be like, give me that damn synopsis, you mooks. Um, but I saw it when I was 13 because I saw it in theaters. Yeah, and me that's too. when it came out. Pretty young to be seeing it. Yeah, I remember, you know, you know I remember uh, like because my dad was a Vietnam or is a Vietnam vet. And uh, I remember he doesn't talk. I heard he got that expunged. It was. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was. <laughs> he got memory redown. Uh, no, he, um, I remember, he doesn't talk about it at all. And I remember it was one of the first times, like, after, uh, I remember the kids who had seen it. I don't know if it was the whole company, a family. But uh, either one of us asked him, hey, like, so was that, like, that felt, like, really real. Like, I, you know, we're, like, 13, 14. Like, so, and I remember my dad was, like, yeah, that's exactly how it is. He's, like, and he's not one to be affected by like movies or in general, like I've never known him to be haunted by anything. And I think it speaks for itself that he never really talked about his military experience that much to at least his kids. But, uh, he talked about, I guess, I mean, we're asking about like the verisimilitude of like the Omaha beach segment with all of the things that you were talking or with all the things like the slow frame rate and the, you know, like the, people just dying and all that stuff like it's well i mean just like you how many how many times do they play like in the first 10 minutes do they do the thing where it's like and banner brothers does it again which is another tom hanks steven spielberg thing where it's like you turn around and the guy you're talking to who is supposed to like radio in Mm -hmm. now has like a hole in his face right i kept a trope count right that trope is you reach over 
and your best friend's face is just a pile of goo. Yeah. Then you know what's up, Marge. Or the guy, <laughs> or the guy who, like takes off his helmet because he's like, oh, good. Yeah, the, the helmet, lucky bastard. Get... That stuck with me very much. And so then he gets shot in the head, though. Right, of course. Yeah, okay. They, the lucky bastard scene where they say, what a lucky bastard because they ricocheted off his helmet. He takes his helmet off to see how lucky he was and he gets shot in the head immediately. Um, yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> V- explain verisimilitude for first time listeners. Um I the way I understand it, I mean you're the word nerd. Uh I think you taught me this word, maybe not. Um it's something that smacks of like truth. Like meaning like if someone were like in the wire, if you've seen the wire You know I've seen the wire. The way in which they talk, I have no no knowledge of exactly how like drug dealers in Baltimore speak but I would say that whatever it is it feels authentic right and therefore to me as a story viewer Saving Private Ryan the verisimilitude of war would be something that was like that that feels like if I were there that would be a very visceral experience very yeah. true to what that would be I don't and know I was telling you the, uh, whoever made Call of Duty World War II, they like watched Saving Private Ryan on Pete while they were designing it because it's uh. so it's such a recreation of it. And it made me realize how much Saving Private Ryan, especially rewatching it, really created like two things I recognized. One, best casting. Oh, yeah. Other than the lack of diversity in any way. Right. Best casting of all time. Like way better. It, like they should have been the expendables. Mm-hmm. But uh, and then also. uh yeah, how influential every single trope from Saving Private Ryan has been like sleeping in a church, um, monologue about missing out on time you could have spent with your loved ones, medic explaining how to perform, how to do surgery on themselves while they die, a uh, guy going, if you want to shoot me, just shoot me. I'm sick of this shit, man. Just do it, man. Shoot me. Yeah. Oh, I'll fucking shoot you right in the, your big mouth, you bazooma. Yeah. Um, the Tom Sizemore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, and he, I thought he was the weak link, acting wise. Really, I thought he was. Eh, uh, he was that, in for me. You know what? Yeah, I mean, he didn't. He didn't have a lot to bite on, but I did love the character stuff, like of him actually putting in, like when he puts in the tin, and like it says France. Right. It's like to him. Oh, that's great, but that's just a script. That's jam. a script thing, but it's like his face is very cold. It's like it's true. It cuts to people like crying and like not knowing how to deal with it, and he's just like, "Yeah, this is just picking up some France." Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll call out more as we go. But I have a, every time a trope that was like very seminal. It's guy dying and be like, "Get this letter to my pa." Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. That one's pretty. That's Vin Diesel. When Vin yeah, Diesel but they dies. invented a bunch of these. The sniper who says a prayer before he kills everyone. That's like, Barry Pepper. God, baby. give me strength. Snipe. Snipe. Yeah. The Lord and walks with me. Snipe. Well, it's not just. <laughs> what's crazy to me is that not just like because f- films influence films, right? That's like, um, for example, one of the tropes th- that is now used by everybody is the shell shock. The idea of like at the beginning, Tom Hanks. Yeah. Yeah. has like quiet and you just hear that or yep. nothing and that hadn't been done on a mass scale before saving private right i don't know if it's the very first iteration it's ever. not i actually know the first okay. iteration of it which is nice. amazing because it was a belgian i want to say belgian. You just call yourself amazing no it's amazing <laughs> uh <laughs> the uh Janusz Kaminski, it's the first time that they worked with each other, Spielberg and uh, Janusz. And Janusz is the director of photography of Saving Private Ryan. They'd never worked with each other. They went on to sh- basically shoot everything together from here. All the Nazis, all the rest many of, other kinds yeah, of humans. Yeah. They shot everything And uh, he found him. I, th- I think he's Polish or Belgian. I don't know. Uh, but he worked on a short film that utilized that trope. Mm. And when Spielberg watched the short film, he was like, that's Absorbed. fucking awesome. Yeah. And it was shot documentary style, handheld with some steady cam stuff, like everything, like it would bleach bypass, like the look bleach bypass is the name of like a, a chemical bath that, that you put the film. Look. It, yeah. It gives it that gray yeah. black and white, like DC comics look. Yep. That's <laughs> uh, now it's all digital, but like back then they bleach bypassed it. All those look and feel things and the shell shock sound thing came from that short. 
So Spielberg What's the name was of the short? I don't remember. I gotta find got it. Got you, nerds! I beg you, <laughs> ride in and rake this motherfucker across the coals. <laughs> He came to the table and he laid a f- feast before you. It's something in Polish. And I don't like, know. Two dishes on the feast are missing. <laughs> Fuck him. I don't know Polish. <laughs> Is that what they speak in Poland? But yeah, it's like uh, when Apple has this sees like a innovative app and it's like, like the- absorb company put into new phone. Yeah, it's like a home <laughs> button. Uh, yeah, but yeah. It's if so, yeah, that thing where all the sound goes quiet and it's just. Ee- but there's like dim explosions yeah. and you see the brutalist kill you've seen so far. But the guy in the foreground doesn't even notice because he's just like, ee! like, that's his world right now. Yeah. yeah, they do that in the beginning and the end for Tom Hanks. He bookends and, those. But how many times in this, uh, going back to like the Band of Brothers or just the Tom Hanks meets Spielberg? Because they both, they weren't as integrally a part of uh, uh, Band of Brothers, but they're executive producers on it. And uh, God, there's so many. Like you mentioned, the sniper who has the, uh, who like kind of says his mantra. There's so many of those that are like, before Barry, Pe- he, be- there's one time that the sniper like kisses the crucifix and then just runs into battle. Right. And if you remember Band of Brothers, there's a guy named Spears who all the l- lieutenant or yeah, Lieutenant Spears, who all of the people are like, yeah, he's fucking crazy. Because he just runs guy into I stuff. I remember other than Ross Winters. from Friends. <laughs> uh, yeah, damn, I can't remember his name. But the Curry guy, Ross from Friends. <laughs> yeah. David Schwimmer, but I can't remember the uh, the character. Yeah, David Swimmer. Swimmer, Schwimmer? I don't know. <laughs> Zimmer? I don't know. Uh, but like Band of Brothers is just like greatest hits of Saving Private Ryan. And yet so, I guess so I'm much getting longer to. in runtime. Well, yeah. There's a bunch. Of, they do a bunch of stuff sometimes. Right. It's a little more. They, all, they add to it. It's a. I'd say it's a cross between Saving Private Ryan and a Ken Burns documentary on World War II because they dwell more on the information and that's what passed. Oh out yeah. The they're, and they're also both spectacular. They're both great in different yeah. ways. Uh, it also felt more like a David Simon, like, um, uh, like you just said, The Wire, or even more Generation Kill. Mm-hmm. Feels a lot like the thing we were just talking about. Anyway, do you want to hear funny titles? <laughs> Yeah. I didn't know when to deploy this, but I guess now. So, you know how this famously there's a porn parody, Saving Ryan's Privates. Uh, you know, you're not laughing. Guys. Well, I mean, I know that it exists, and it's like you switched some words. It's well, not the, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's on the level with any porn title. I just think it's I'm a not uniquely like, good shit, title. I'm sorry, let's take it back. What? Here's my point. Saving Private Ryan, so evocative. You hear it and you're like, there's going to be Private Ryan. I bet it's about a war. They're going to save him. It's going to be a mission. There's going to be tough guys. <laughs> Ryan's going to be there. So I'm, I'm going gonna, to be there. I'm going to love it. Um, and <laughs> so I came up with <laughs> other titles that are equally provocative in the same vein. And I just want to read them. But like to you. jokes. No, very serious. <laughs> this is serious. So Saving Private Ryan, uh, as we said, Saving Ryan's Privates, that's not mine. Here we draw the line and move into originals territory. Just imagine the plot of these movies. All right. Raiden Myron, the pirate. <laughs> Wait, you think you get points for like semi rhymes? All the pretty Cylons. <laughs> All the pretty Cylons. Oh. Paying several Ronin. To do what? Who knows? They're not Ronin. They're disgraced. They're doing their job. They're not following their master. They're crazy. You don't know what they could do. They're doing, that is the point. They're <laughs> following their master. They're following the chief general, whatever guy. Famous Ray's Pizzolatis. Wait, say that one again. Famous Ray's Pizzolatis. <laughs> because some of them are Italian? It's a pizza place where you do Pilates. <laughs> no, because it sounds like Saving Private Ryan. Kind of. Earning pilot's license. Saving, pri- earning pilot's license. I'll, okay, I'm going to rattle off a bunch so we get yeah, through this. Yeah, just keep going, man. You're on, you're, you win in the war. Raiden, Lightning Rider. <laughs> Suave Ryan, Private Eye. Partially Sleeved Rascals. <laughs> Spaying Ryan's Pitbull. Portia de Rossi Siren. That's a siren that would go off when Portia de... Anyway. It's not a siren that she sounds like? Like if she no. you touch her inappropriately? In her proximity, like, the siren alerts you. Gotcha. The Portia She's de Rossi's arriving. here, yeah. Uh. Stunning pie arrangements. 
proving Paul Ryan right. That's a passion project. I really care about that one. <laughs> Salving rashy privates. Salmon pickle Reuben. That's a sandwich idea. That's not a movie idea. Certain prayers are ribald. And of course, losing my religion. <laughs> Losing my religion doesn't even rhyme. Saving private. It rhymes. <laughs> nerds, I beg you. Write losing. in rhyme nerds and explain to this motherfucker <laughs> how losing my religion rhymed. Losing my religion. <sighs> <laughs> the, this is the worst segment we've done. <laughs> I think I beg to disagree. I think it spices up the podcast right in the middle <laughs> when it's starting to drag. But here's the here's my thing. I want. I'm going to do it with every movie. All right, all right. I'm glad. I'm so glad. Get ready for October Sky, you Rocktober guy. <laughs> They're not even words anymore. You're not yeah. even trying. But it's like, why? Why do they rhyme? Like saving Ryan's privates isn't even like a rhyme. Like the focus is on <laughs> private and privates. And a guy oh. named Ryan. Oh. So it has nothing to do with rhyming. All right. I read my it. list. Well, I didn't get the that's like second meaning of it. What? That's very clever. Shut up. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like why? Like they don't try. Like look at the Fast and Furious <laughs> series. No, no, no. They're let's, not even trying to <laughs> rhyme. All right. They're just doing numbers. Let's this talk point. about the cast in this movie. Can I, we? Yeah. I got us off the rails. I feel like I have the prerogative no, I love the, to get I love us back the rails on the rails. You had us on. I just <laughs> think that you're weird. Well, having not watched this in a long while, I'll have to say several incredible moments where, what the fuck, Paul Giamatti is in this? Yeah, it is. Holy shit, Ted Danson is in this? Dude, dude. dude yeah, dear dude. God, Malcolm Reynolds from Firefly, Nathan, Nathan Fillion, Fillion is yeah. the fake Private Ryan. Yeah, dude, he's Amazing. fake, and he's like my my brother's my brother's dad. Yeah, and, and he, he looks so young too. Speaking of tropes, this introduced, and he gets to do I think more like a range of emotion he never gets to do because he's always a tough guy or mm -hmm. like an arrogant dude. Um, but speaking of inventing tropes, this movie actually invented the post credit sequence. Although I thought it was in poor taste that in the post credit sequence they show that Nathan Fillion's grammar school brothers are dead like just incidentally <laughs> they're just dead you don't even know how they died there's just like a letter there that says mr policeman i sent you all the clues <laughs> it's really weird anyway to space <laughs> yeah. you go well it was a setup for like a movie they didn't get around to for a while but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy your future career uh anyway tom hanks it's tom. about world war ii you got tom and tom sizemore <laughs> hanks yeah Obviously, Matt Damon, Edward Burns, right. who is a guy who you you recognize. He's the guy who's like, "I'm leaving." Yeah. To Tom Hanks and Tom and Tom Sizemore is like, "I will shoot you in the face." There's a uh, bunch of like that that guys. that guys, like yeah. Adam Goldberg, who I love, whose hair I love. Yeah. Um, Which how cool is that sequence where he's like Juden? He's like Juden. I wrote. I was okay. Good. I'm glad you also wrote it down. One of the most cathartic sequences in the whole movie is just. A tr like a trail of German soldiers coming by yeah. and the one Jewish guy in the troop like holding up his Star of David and going like, I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. Ju yeah. Hello. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Uh, and of Ju course, he has the uh, worst death probably in the whole movie. No. Well, yeah. I mean, that scene was is the most hard to it's take. It's the most the memorable, but yeah. after rewatching it again, because I'd seen it out of theaters. I watched it a few years ago when I did a Spielberg class, but I've Ooh, only, la -da. Oh, I, you go to <laughs> classes. Uh, the, what stuck with me this time was the acting of Giovanni Ribisi. Yeah. And his death. Holy medic. Wade. I did say, no, actually, I take it back. I wrote Wade's was the hardest death. I cried the most. Right. It was the worst but death. Yeah. Adam Goldberg, that whole sequence is, in fact, actually was uh, on the cuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Spielberg no, talks. No, no, no. Quite the opposite, <laughs> my dear friend. It was off the cuff. Off the cuff. <laughs> yeah, it was off the cuff. That's right. <laughs> off the cuff death scene. Uh, that was not... They were like planning on having a whole fight, or I don't remember what they were planning on having, but Tom Hanks and uh, Steven Spielberg were watching the the shoot take place and they realized either because of speed of day or first they just had the tom hanks had the idea but 
as the story goes, Tom Hanks whispered into Spielberg's ear, wouldn't it be cool if the way in which, you know, uh, Goldberg dies is like a slow knife to the chest as he goes like, no, 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 no. And that's very visceral, right? Like we all Maybe the creepiest thing Tom Hanks has ever been attributed to doing is even yeah. like suggesting that they do that in a movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, it reminds me of just like uh, on Lord of the Rings when they were like, so when you stab someone in like the back where was it yeah they were talking about uh aragorn like slight quietly killing a like one of the orcs yeah and like christopher lee's like you do not tell me how you silently kill someone <laughs> i've done it sir oh and, my gosh that reminds me i was at comic-con one year and i saw a panel of famous fantasy writers on the topic of battle scenes how to write good epic battle scenes that seem realistic right realistic or verisimilitudinous jesus <laughs> And you're the pretentious one between the two of us. That's the thing. Wow, I don't agree. Well, I sound the pretentious one. I'm the pretentious one What's here. What's funny I- is within my eyeline is a picture on my mantle of me in like a Lord's <laughs> wig and pantaloons and tights. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I'm not the pretentious one. And you have your hand like a, yeah. like as if you're holding like a, a teacup. French Lord's wave. Yeah. What French a Lord? French Lord waving you off to your death without caring. What the fuck was I? Oh, Comic-Con panel. of So anyway, they interview these authors who have good advice, solid, normal advice for writers on like battle scenes Mm -hmm. and how to pace battle scenes. And it gets to Robert Jordan, who writes The uh, Eye of the World is the first book in the series. Wheel of Time is the name of the series. It's this epic series. yeah. Yeah. Many. Anyone who knows fantasy knows it. It's a million pages. He died without finishing it and they finished it anyway, et cetera, et cetera. But... He fought in, I believe, Vietnam, possibly Korean War. But they get to him and he goes, <laughs> you know where this is going because it's what you just said. But he yeah. goes, you know how I know what it seems like when you kill a human being <laughs> and the light of their life leaves their eyes? Well, an inch from your eyes. I know because I've seen it, because I've done it. Jesus. And he's like, what you just said is bullshit. In the 16th century, a claymore could not be lifted with one arm, even by a six-foot man, which at that time was unusual anyway. He would have had a squire kneeling, like holding the claymore. Then he would mount the horse with the help of a second squire and take the claymore, (laughs) which has a range of 8.5 feet and you know how because i've used it <laughs> because like, I've used, everything, I, I, everything was like oh i've just killed lots of people that's I how i write battle scenes that's so because <laughs> it's like everyone just turns into robert shaw from jaws <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dozes. <laughs> yeah no i mean and that's like i don't know tom hanks hasn't <laughs> that's, been a, that's great that's great <laughs> that's great uh, god bless America. tom i don't know if tom hanks has been in a war he doesn't seem like a guy who's been in a war but who what the fuck do i know i haven't Wait, been in a war that's fitting to the movie because they do another trope which is oh you're gonna find out something secret about the captain and then you do and it's like you know i've killed like a million nazis but i was a school teacher yeah. back home oh dude i was English just lit. a nice guy yeah, yeah. Which is true of Tom Hanks on like a meta level too, I think. Yeah, just as like the nice guy. Right. It's almost weird. It's almost a commentary in the sense that it was weird to see Tom Hanks from Splash and Money Pit and the Burbs do this role at that time. We're used to it now. I guess he'd done Philadelphia already. But I do like or not yet. And you got mail. And you got mail, which was very serious. (laughs) Um, But I do think there were a couple things that were almost commentaries on the movie itself. Mm. Um, Especially there was this one sequence where, and I love this maneuver, if indeed it was intentional, even if it's not, I like happy accidents. You know the sequence where Hanks is starting to go nuts and he makes them go off course to root out a machine gun nest. That's where Wade gets killed. Um, The opening of that scene, and up to now, Hanks has had like the shaky hand and yeah. been like nervous, but nothing crazy. Yeah. And the guys literally say, this is not important. We can succeed in our whole mission without doing yeah. this. And it's funny because I had already written the note that structurally, this is the first sequence we've encountered that's not necessary to the plot. Yes. And I was wondering, why is it here? And then Hanks, in a single line and shot, answers both you in a meta way and them. And he, he goes, our objective is to win the war with crazy eyes. And you're like, okay, well, he's answering in the sense that, oh, we're seeing the sequence to show that Tom Hanks is going nuts. Yeah. It is a necessary sequence. And he's deemed it necessary that we take this unnecessary risk to kill this 
machine gun nest, yeah. which is especially fitting in the sense that how can he not start losing faith when the whole mission they are doing, saving Private Ryan, yeah. is objectively not objective. Like it's a feelings based mission that's a stupid waste of lives. And it's uh it's verified because it's after that whole like sequence is done, they send off the German sh- soldier and uh you know the they have the Edward Burns is about to walk away but then he tells him he's a school teacher at the end of that he then has a line that's something along the lines of like we have one mission to to save Ryan to save that private so it's like and it's like directly juxtaposes what he says of like the reason to go to the radar tower is while they're leaving it he says like the only thing that matters because he's like, I'm not going to allow, I like, there, a little piece of me dies every time. He talks about his wife and how, like, next time he's going to see his wife, uh, he, he's unsure of if she's going to recognize him because a piece of him dies every time he sees another death. And it's just kind of like, well, the whole motivation for going to the radar tower, like, you are an inconsistent decision maker. Right, and that's how you know he's falling apart because he's torn between... He also can't see any more of his own men die. Like he's just starting to lose the temperament for it. And yet he wants to win the wars to validate what he's doing, why he lost those men. And yet he just wants to get Private Ryan out of there for a cynical reason, because it would be the end of his duty and he could go home. So he's just going nuts. And then I think another trope, which is probably the least realistic part of the movie, because I do think the movie... In the same way that Unforgiven was seminal, it was the first war movie that's like, war is hell is going to be a major part of it. And we have the effects budget to show that now. Like, All Quiet on the Western Front, the message is war is hell. Yeah. But they just show that with like, oh, I died and a butterfly lands on my hand. It's sad. In this, you're like, fuck, man. I w- I'm happy I was not in World War II. Um, and yet I salute them because it's good the Nazis were beaten. Um, but Jesus, God. And I think that's become an important staple of war movies. But this movie was early in that idea. And it's still shied away at the end because they still have a climactic <clears throat> battle yeah. where like the music strikes up and plays like an American anthem kind of song. And it's like, it's go get them boys. It's great that they're all going to muster together and do like an oceans 11 sequence where he's like, here's what we do. We get the sticky bomb. We put it on the tread. It's going to be fine. And like everyone does something useful and great. Uh, even up who's fucking pathetic, Mm -hmm. uh, like takes 18 prisoners and we'll probably get a bunch of medals for no reason. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, I guess I felt like, uh, they it softened at the end. It's still like, and God bless America, because I'm Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. I'm not going to be Kurt Vonnegut and go like, and that's why humans don't deserve to exist, because look at this right. mess. <clears throat> like, right. I'm it's not like Lars they, von Trier. We per, uh, <laughs> persevered. Yeah, it's it, it's got a lot of John Ford in it, and I'm not going to just talk about like the in like kind of what you're mentioning, which is there's a fine line between you know, heartfelt kind of, you know, especially because war films are always about like the tragic, right? Um, Or they often are. And therefore it's like, how do you deal with, how do you rectify that at the end? Well, a lot of people do propaganda and that's kind of what John Ford did because he was, you know, during that time, they had just come out of it. And so when he made films like they were expendable, which were kind of like, oh shit, like right. that it's the start of that movement yeah, that this is kind of, but just for context for people who maybe don't know the name, he did the classic Westerns like pre unforgiven West, yeah. the searchers can you rattle off a couple more probably. Yeah. Man who shot Liberty Valance. Okay. So like the classic, uh, Western that you'd see, what the fuck's his name? Shane, uh, the Duke. John Wayne and yeah. John Ford and John Wayne, just American. Just a bunch of Johns, just like this is a bunch of towns. So you're saying when he made a movie that showed like, actually it sucks to get shot. It was in a war. big yeah. deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a big deal. And in fact, uh, I think Spielberg actually pointed out at that at, in this film, if you remember a very, another memorable scene is when they, uh, the pre, when they, it's the, where, where is he from? Iowa? Uh, Who, Hanks? No, uh, Private Ryan. 
Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, when it cuts to Iowa and oh my the mom walks out, and yeah. there's she, all she needs to see is the priest and the guy who takes his hat off, like the from the, the army. major or whatever it is, and she knows that some one of my children is dead, and you know because of context of seeing Brian Cranston. You know, yeah, one armed <laughs> Brian Cranston uh, announces they're dead. Yeah, exactly. Which is like, I did because he wasn't a thing last time I'd seen it. So I it had was, no idea. I was yeah. like, oh shit. You know, anyway, um, that shot is through the, if you remember, there's a frame that's very like, it's super awesome, which is you just see the plains of Iowa through a yep. dorm frame. She's completely still wet because there's no light and you're looking outside at, you know, like the, the sky. whole sequence I wrote is geometrically flawless. It's flawless. Like if you look at the rule of thirds and shit, yeah, it's amazing how they got this perfectly zigzag <clears throat> road to bisect with her mirror right, and like her right. eyes flick up just as the car enters the first car pain of the yeah. window it's incredible and i think it's 1955 <laughs> the searchers has that exact shot now that was oh. center punch but it, and it's not when someone's arriving it's when john wayne and the group are leaving uh so it's oh you like, mean the shot out the front door where it's like a, a damsel in distress and essentially. she collapses and yeah. in this case like a mother who's about to grieve um but it's like kind of a nod to sometimes sometimes it's not a glorious walk out in the sunset sometimes this is like this is the water we have to hold. This is the cross we have to bear because right. of war. Uh, and I think that, that it's diametrically opposed, which is not to say that John Ford is a propagandist filmmaker. He has been, but it's like to show it's like, I feel like it's Spielberg rectifying like all of the Westerns he made, all the war films that he made that were like, rah, 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 you know, United States and Although stuff Schindler's like list is a they, pretty unflinching <clears throat> look. At yeah. The and even they will expend, they were, they were expendable is still, I mean, everyone who worked on that film were, was ex-military, which is crazy. So and it, it's when, like, in like the credits, they like say like you can't fool major, them. They know the shit was rough. Yeah. They knew the shit was rough, and so, but and and at the end, it's a very like it's bittersweet, but it's very much so like uh, you know like the United States. They had to do what they had to right. do, uh, which is no different from I guess what this is doing. But it's never. I mean, just look at Omaha Beach. He's not trying to candy coat any of the war. It reminded me a lot of like uh, Children of Men. I mean, so yeah, obviously it's bookended by an opening battle that was so awesome and brutal and visceral that it redefined how we shoot like huge battle sequences. And then at the end, the climactic battle is literally almost a challenge to itself. Like, yeah, here comes the climax battle. Everyone knows it's coming. You think we couldn't top that first battle? Let's fucking top it. Yeah, like they treat the tank that they combat as a T Rex. I think literally, like he borrows from himself from Jurassic Park. I love that in Jurassic Park, the shaking water, and you go like T Rex. In this shot of Tom Hanks's hand shaking, and you hear stomping, and he goes tank. Yeah, Panzer tank. It's the exact same thing. <clears throat> I mean, the first Omaha Beach is very much about, and that's actually, it's surprising to me because there's a lot of things that caught on at the beginning of this. We talked about how like the shell shock, you know, like all these tropes got picked up. The sh- uh, the slow motion plus uh, sh- slow shutter speed, Gladiator. which is like, yeah, and at this around the same time, what year was it? This Ninety. Came? Oh, let me check my notes real quick. And. Gladiator was 98. 99 was Gladiator. 2000, 2000, 99 to 2001. I can't remember which Gladiator came out. That popularized uh, high shutter speed. And Gladiator's 2000. So they had time to steal from yeah, Saving so they Private stole, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I guess, so what those terms mean, like shutter speed, is the the shutter, it's like um, the, so what has to happen, the mechanics of uh, the film camera is it moves it moves the frame up or down or side to side, depending on which camera you're using of, um, you know, just move the frame while I obscure, uh, essentially the iris, the aperture, like any light from coming in. So it's complete darkness. And then it's the spinning thing, a shutter, uh, or it's usually in film cameras, it's spinning, but like, it can just be a thing that comes down like a, a gate, a block. Um, but it opens and it opens for a, determined length of time it can be very fast or it can be very slow uh now high shutter speed gives you that you know like in gladiator when you see like when he kicks the sand at the and they're in the middle of the you know uh coliseum or whatever and you see like the grains of sand and everything feels like really like almost kind of otherworldly but in a way that is like you can see everything too well everything's too 
right. still sharp. too sharp. That is high shutter speed, slow sh- shutter speed, like you have in uh, Omaha Beach, where it's just the guy who's lost his arm and he's just like slowly looking around and grabbing stuff. And it's kind of the strobe effect where it's like things are kind of blurry. It's the exact opposite. That's slow. By the way, it also invented the trope I realized of that mode in first person shooters where you're almost dead, but you're not quite. And you still have a pistol and you just shoot a couple more times because yeah. that's how Hanks goes down. Earn it. But... um. I think one of the main things it invented is the cop-out ending where Tom Hanks, who's slowly been going insane because he's a good man asked to do truly inhuman things for the sake of his country, um, suddenly has a locker room pep talk monologue spontaneously come out of him that not only pulls the morale of his whole troop together who are on the verge of shooting each other in the face, but also seems to cohese his own psychology where he's like, I'm good now. God bless America. <laughs> like, could just because of a speech he gives. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's kind of a cop out, but I'm fine with it because then that lets you make the whole third act of the movie just, so now we got to kill this big fucking monster. It's this tank. We're going to shoot it like Jesus Christ Superstar where it even looks bigger than a tank would look even. Yeah. They like they shoot it to exaggerate the tank's size in cool ways. Um, I love that shot where it crests a hill and it looks like a tidal wave. Like the tank absolutely looks like a wave crashing over them. Right. It's awesome. Right. And it makes what's clearly got like animal sounds mixed in. As it crests, it's like, (laughs) fucking tank. (laughs) (laughs) Which is the sound of the cheetah. (laughs) Right. And the final battle is just fucking amazing. Um, And includes all the best Upham stuff where he's such a pathetic coward that he lets Adam Goldberg get. It's funny you said that's improv because I did notice this time through. Uh, They must have slammed it together because it's super clear that he's a head through a hole in the wooden floor Mm -hmm. and his body is like a dummy that they stuffed quickly to get this sequence. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, I also noticed speaking of sizes and tell me if I'm wrong because you're better at like cataloging the shots in your head, but I felt like the only time they did super closes outside of people's faces to, for dialogue scenes, it was exclusively to show that even in the midst of war, there's still nice things. Like all the super closes I can remember are at the camp, close up of coffee being poured, close up of a guy taking a sh- getting a shave, close up of like friends joking, but just their mouths laughing. Then like later when they're in the woods and they know it's the worst battle they're going to face thus far, Close up of water falling on leaves, close mm-hmm. up of like beautiful slow mo shots of. And I just thought there was this kind of cool thing of like Tom Hanks would pause to note when things weren't as hellish. Yeah, that's a. I, I argue that's a common theme in Spielberg. Yeah. Because he's David. He, he's the film that Spielberg watches before he makes every all of his films and has been is Lawrence of Arabia, which is David Lean. And David Lean has, I think I talked about this on. I haven't seen it. In, uh, yeah. On the Cracked podcast with uh, Tom. Movie uh, Club. Cracked Movie Club. I talked about Jaws, how um, in. Da- in it, there's a thing that he steals all the time, which is um, the way in which T.H. Lawrence dies in, Ar- in Arabia. It's just. Spoilers. Oh, yeah. I just said I had. He dies seen on it. a motorcycle. I heard toilet. <laughs> Uh, but the way in which he shows that he dies is it's just like uh, the goggles that he's wearing uh, are just like in the in a tree and they're just like being pushed by the wind. So it's like to show like <laughs> the sudden <laughs> and the empty motorcycle just idles just, by <gasps> and a kid goes, bum, bum, bum. come back, T.H. Lawrence, come back. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like uh it's it's like it shows like here's this crazy violence that just happened but we're gonna document it with like this kind of s- zen moment yeah and i think that he's playing with that he does that a lot in this film i mean that's kind of the shell shock thing in jaws he does it with it's just waves lapping after someone got pulled under but in this film speaking to like the the good things the like the coffee being shot uh the, you know like i think what he's doing is that's like Hanks or whoever's perspective we're looking at at like 
here are just the snapshots of war. It's mixed with all these horrible things that you kind of dwell on these right. like beautiful things. And I think that that's kind of like, it's, it's kind of a, uh, introspection into memory, which I think is kind of doing the same thing as the, uh, Lawrence of Arabia thing, because what it's saying is like, here's this crazy event that happened. What do you remember? Well, I remember the, you know, my uh, motorcycle goggles just drifting in the wind. Oh yeah. 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 Like well, I remember the, co- the smell pieces, of coffee right. beans, you know, like, and it's, yeah, I like that little stuff though. Like it's clear that Hanks has trained himself when his hand starts shaking to slowly take a drink from his canteen. Yeah. Like they, he never says it, but it's obviously a ritual he does for that to make his hand stop shaking. Interesting. I thought it was a thing of like, well, if you, if you have like the shakes or whatever, like picking something up, is helpful because it, yeah. it distracts away exactly. from the, yeah. yeah so, so he did it because he was self conscious about it yeah exactly but then yeah it turned Which into like. a ritual um, either way potato potato no it's yeah it's all the same and uh, I also thought they got a lot of uh, mileage out of like the split screen shots natural split screen not actual split screen like the uh, the two spots in focus you mean uh yeah for the clearest example is when the little girl that they save and then don't save when Vin Diesel gets shot is slapping her dad for, oh I love that and in the background they're you like regathering their shit and just moving on yeah and I think it just develops the idea that there's so much crazy shit happening all the time like who even knows what the fuck is going on and they do that a lot in the movie where like Tom Hanks is talking to a dude yeah. and in the background very elaborate special effects of a whole fight scene where many people are dying are happening but they don't even have time to notice that that's happening or the other one I like is a full shootout is going on that any other movie predating this movie would absolutely center punch on and focus on. And Vin Diesel on the left, which is split screen by just like a natural line from a thing that fell is looking through a series of apples to see if any of the apples are good enough to eat and right. eating apples. And then one of the bullets from frame right intrudes too far on the left, and he suddenly goes like, what the fuck? And he's part of the... <laughs> now he jumps no, over a, to the yeah, right yeah. side and starts shooting at guys. It's yeah. like, what? this is the movie I'm in. Oh, I'm a new movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I love that shit. And I think that that's... Because that's what this movie's a lot about is like, there, if you're in war, there's no... There's a line in uh, Generation Kill that I always jumped out at me, which is the HBO series, which he was like, somewhat uh, the the photographer or the uh, journalist asks one of the uh, like the major, he's like, is like I don't feel safe. Is it safe to go out there? And he's like, well, actually, like Iraq's like a very safe country. Behind this wheel, no one can hit me, so it's very safe right here. I walk five feet over there, I can easily be killed. It's not safe, but right here, I'm very safe. It's just like, mm. I think that that's kind of what you're talking about is that Vin just Diesel like feels Los safe. Angeles. Yeah. Aha. Aha. <laughs> Vin Diesel feels safe and then uh, until there's like he's getting shot. Right. Or like if you're down in the trench and then you pop up, it's a whole different world. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's another shot that speaks. Well, can I just say, oh, I yeah. think, because you made me realize, uh, again, you never know if symbolism is intentional, but you like to think it is. But I think in a way, especially when you see the bookends that are clearly like pro America mm. and that it was worth it. Um, the movie is doing just that and is maybe aware of that. It's doing that. It's walking that line and splitting that screen between like a safe war movie and a provocative war is hell movie. Yeah. And it's trying to do both at once mm-hmm. and not detract from like, yeah, when Adam Goldberg dies, you're like, that shit happens in war. When Upham seems, sees the guy who he refused to war crime mm-hmm. kill Tom Hanks and is like, no, I will war crime you. Yeah. You're like, man, I don't even know if that was right to do. Like, this just is just a moral gray area. Yeah, the thin red l- line. Right? right. But then they also want to have within this two hour and 49 minute movie, the traditional movie where, God damn it, Tom Hanks, everyone's dad, blows up the tank and says something inspirational to Matt Damon, everyone's brother or son. Yeah. yeah. And he is glad and it was worth it. And I think it succeeds. It does both well. Yeah. Uh, you can argue whether that's politically like what they should have done or not. I'm not, I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because it's not, what I love about Spielberg is that he finds a way in which to show a thing like that. That's his theme or it's like a posit. It's like an argument. Maybe he probably wouldn't call it that because I don't think he's an argumentative, like he's not a political filmmaker, but 
uh, Upham, who's played by Jeremy Davies, who's the guy in Lost, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, um, there's a moment when he had to stay back because he's not really a good, you know, warrior. So during the radar section, he didn't have to stay back. He's a fucking coward. <laughs> he's a coward. <laughs> and uh, Giovanni Ribisi, uh, Wade, uh, right? Wade is the right. Yeah, medic Wade, he, the medic, and he's gotten killed or he's in process of dying. And they're like, "Hey, we need get all that stuff." Uh, you know, like water and supplies. Water and morphine. supplies. And so it's not just like you mentioned the split screen, like visual real estate. Is a that's one trick to show exactly what you just said. Also, if you remember. Uh, as Davies is running through, there's all that smoke from all the grenade blasts. Right. So you're just, he grabs the two bags and he starts running and it's a sh- like a steady cam shot where it's just following him on his back. There's like th- two or three seconds of you just see fog and everything's quiet and it's, a, you hear some distant yelling and stuff, but then as he cuts through the fog, so instead of a split screen, it's just a reveal. It's absolute mayhem around or BC because yeah. everyone's, uh, do we give him morphine? I don't know what to do. And you, everyone's shouting. And it's just like this fog of war where I don't know what's going to be behind that, but it's probably going to be horrible. And, but yeah. before that, it's kind of like an angelic shot, kind of like a sudden, before this uh, calm before the storm yeah like the classic war movie would reference that a guy died but they would hide it with smoke out of like uh deference to the Hayes commission or like the public sensibility and this movie did both like Mm -hmm. it's i think i'm sure there was like here's the death scene with in the clean way and then the fog disperses the fog of war here's what it fucking looks like and the guy's literally feeling his own liver going oh god my my liver liver. and they go what what about it what should we do to save you your liver and he goes just give me more morphine and you're like oh okay i guess liver's fatal god that's so it's rough that's a rough scene and i i want to say the fog thing uh, Battleship Potemkin, but I can't remember the shot, so maybe it's not right. I know that Kubrick was uh, Paz of Glory. He did a lot of that stuff. But does the fog like not pass the fog, by like, to reveal horror? <laughs> yeah, well, it was like uh, Paz of Glory is famous for like the you're inside the trenches and everything feels cool, and then you look out and it's like, oh, fuck. You know, it's like uh, the reveal of like the sudden, the calm before the storm stuff that uh, Spielberg does yeah. here. But so that's a trope, but I mean, like. I don't know if it was used as effectively or as numerous in different ways. Like when we talk about like a director's toolkit or his toolbox, Spielberg is the best at doing like, I'm going to do this calm before the storm storm thing that we've been talking about for 10 minutes, but I'm going to do it in like, I'm going to do frame reveals. I'm going to do split screen essentially. I'm going to like surprise you with focus. I'm going to surprise you with, you know, like, camera pants like every every uh tool in his box is doing it oh man there's a pan shot that goes far medium close it must have been so hard to do at that time that's awesome in the final battle when it goes like it goes like from a molotov cocktail in close up to the tan to the cannon that the cocktail blows up which is distant over to tom hanks's head and medium looking over to see that happen and then shout out what they should do next and it's just functional to keep the geography clear but god it's so masterful how clear the geography is in that whole final battle like they develop many traditional dramas and they weave them all so well and you always know like you could draw a map of everything that happened Mm -hmm. which is Mm -hmm. harder just watch a born movie Right. And you'll realize it's hard to do that. Like you couldn't draw a map of where that fight sequence happened. And he does it in a, like the easy way, the dumb way to do that, not dumb because it can be effective, but like the easy way most people do it is, well, let's just show a wide of it. Geography established. He does it by blocking and movement. and camera Right. Movement. Like a dude runs, does a whole sequence, then runs to a window and looks down. And the next shot is a punch through the window at the thing you just saw. So you know where yeah. you are before it pans to the next thing. Yeah. Uh, it's just storyboarded. Speaking of born <laughs> born <laughs> since Matt Damon has become Oops. Jason born. Doesn't it feel weird? I just felt like watching it now. He Damon's such a big name in his own right. And is like a superhero uh-huh. many times over. Then when he gets there and he goes, all right, it's the third act. We need him, that guy, Matt Damon, you, come here. 
I have something secret to tell you. I really thought he was going to go like, just kill Hitler. We know you got those powers. Oh, right. right. Like, I thought the you final act would be. sweet, sweet yeah. Iowa power. And he's like, but I don't have inner rage to fuel my vengeance. Well, your brothers are dead. My origin story is <laughs> happening. <laughs> and then he would just like backflip. And I guess Inglorious Bastards has tainted my view of World War II movies. I'm like Hitler can die in this, right? Yeah, yeah, for for no. I mean, it's all just a video game, soon to be. Uh, <laughs> that's also. Do you know anything about the dude that played Ryben? Because his the symmetry of his face, Edward Burns. That was Edward Burns. Yeah, and the stuff he did in the movie made me feel like this movie was supposed to launch him. And he's the only right, person he's like I didn't hands- recognize. He's like a handsome and like a Spielberg, like character actor right and you're talking to a guy who recognizes adam goldberg giovanni rubisi and you know without looking them up and barry pepper right but i don't know who that riven guy is edward burns famed scottish poet edward burns yeah famed (laughs) scottish poet yeah he never really took off to be honest with you like i'm looking at his imdb right now there's not a lot to be recognized say the name again is it edward burns huh Edward Burns. Edward Burns. Edward Burns. I'm, uh, looking, I'm looking up whatever happened to Edward Burns. Like, Is it B-Y-R-N-E-S? No, it's B-U-R-N-S. Like Burns. Like I have Burns. Like Edward Burns. The Nothing, man. I guess he just is probably a bad person and so people didn't want to work his with His name him. is Edward. Slander. I'll see you in court, Fitzgerald Burns. Fitzgerald <laughs> Burns. Uh, I've recognized him from stuff, but it's funny because I can't really like, it's mostly, I guess, TV. Um, well, burn burns. <laughs> no one <laughs> kept up with you. I'm sorry. I want, what did I you want to say about humans. him? He was in will and grace. I don't um, know. that he did like a fine job, but it's weird to me that when you have even to the smallest part, like Vin Diesel, who's not a great actor, not even in this movie, but you're like, just by the mere fact that he was in this cast, he's destined to be huge. Yeah. Like everyone who appeared in this movie is now or was already super famous. Right. And like Matt Damon wasn't that big and Nathan Fillion hadn't done anything, but yet somehow it's like a reverse curse. And I'm like, he's the one dude. Tom Sizemore is a fucking monster. Uh-huh. It came out yesterday that he got kicked off a set for trying to have sex with an 11 year old girl yeah. or rub her vagina. Um, and sorry to be very clear and uh yeah that shot where tom sizemore is rolling over all the dudes in the trench to get to hanks yeah i'm like those dudes all have stds now that's horrible <laughs> uh, but um my point is sizemore yeah. has a career he had yeah what did this ribbon guy do i don't <laughs> to know piss off don't Hollywood? Know. He, he's no mad damon uh but it's interesting you mentioned that they, it's 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 weird how <laughs> war films launch like different types of white dudes <laughs> like their careers because sure. band of brothers also did that they didn't launch him but like uh if you watch band of brothers there's a bunch of people who are like he's in this shit yeah you know like uh fast benders in it mm-hmm. uh fucking weird ones too uh what's his name the comedian uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon. Oh, in it. oh yeah. Simon Pegg's in it. It feels like Michael Shannon should be in it, but he isn't. Is no, he? he's not. <laughs> and then in the Pacific, which is yet another one, like Stephen Ambrose uh, and uh, Steven Spielberg, um, uh, Rami or Rami Malek, who's now a Mr. Robot, and he's right. launching as like he's going to be the next uh, 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 Daredevil. Uh, no, fucking. <laughs> Uh, the Freddie Mercury. Hulk. Oh, he's gonna be Freddie Mercury. That's a better choice. Yeah, Ant Man. <laughs> but it's like he's yeah, he's Ant Man, uh, Mister Robot, but, but a superhero. That's just a random aside. Is that like I guess it's because they always need like, well, everyone's gonna die in war films. Bring in the white dudes. Uh, seems I guess to be the trope in Call of Duty World War II. I literally walked all around the camp. Well, here's the thing, I. Uh, People get, I no, we're going off on too much of a rant, dude, um, but this is, (laughs) I don't buy that argument because every period piece, including Save It Private Ryan, like go on movieoops.com or whatever the fuck the nerds have been up to. 
you can find hundreds of anachronisms. For example, I'll tell you one. In World War II, a ton of German equipment had crosses on them, not swastikas, Christian crosses. Mm -hmm. But Christian groups don't like depicting that because obviously bad guys think they're good guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? But they don't like seeing that in movies. So movie go makers out of deference to how Christian we are as a culture don't show it. And including in Saving Private Ryan, you never yep. see a piece of equipment with a Christian cross on it that the Germans are operating. Um, where is that going with this? The point is we fuck with the reality of everything all the time. And yet people will use arguments like, well, in my fantasy novel that has magic fireballs that shoot out of your hands, I still have to have the people be racist against people with dark skin because it's set in a 1400s-ish era. Motherfucker, you made up everything about everything in the world. And I just think if you want a better world to exist, put out stories that depict like moral standards as you see them. Don't show like racist society and not comment on it just because that's who history was, bro. If they have swords, <clears throat> they got to be racist. Like, I don't buy that. I think that's a really interesting like psychological or like social th thing because sure. it's like a weird awareness of like, because I don't like if you were to have like um, a cross on a gun or whatever, like whatever they're doing, like I don't care because it's just a fucking piece of equipment. But and I know it's true that yeah. a lot of those guys in the forties, they thought some weird shit about different races, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, yeah. and like, if it wasn't there, I'd be like, that's a little weird. So it's like, you're right. And also like, and that's wrong. <laughs> right. but, but the thing is, it's like, because they do it in ways that aren't noticeable because I don't give a fuck about if that's the real gun. Someone does, sure. but if they're like, that gun wasn't invented until 1965, I'm like, right. Yeah, but it looks like it could have yeah, been invented. Yeah, yeah. For a similitude. Yeah. But my point is, I'm playing Call of Duty World War II. I walk around my whole camp in like the free open area yeah. trying to find like a lady or a person of color. They do throw in some like special operative women. Uh, you know, because like the British forces, they allowed women. I'm sure but then I realized as it was jolting, I was like, oh, that's right. There aren't any because everyone's racist and like the black regiment was a segregated regiment. Yeah. But in the next level, I like ride my Jeep under a train right. to derail it and then shoot dudes in the head in the air while I flip over <laughs> like, uh, you know, rocket launcher exploding. Why the fuck? Anyway, yeah. choose what to perpetuate and not perpetuate. That's all. <laughs> Woo. There I is. Yeah. That's just. That's all I got. We sh we this episode's gone on longer than it should have because we should have said movie. That. It's a long movie. It's true. No, no, not that I mean there's a limit. I just mean I shouldn't have said any of that shit. I just any of said. that shit. <laughs> uh, what else do I want to say? I'm out, so you you wrap it up if you got a final point. if there's anything point. that you can edit or insert. I talked about frame length. I've talked about frame width. You want to insert Bleach a discussion bypass. on width and length? <laughs> no, I was just talking about like director shit that people, like if you rewatch the film, you might notice and go, oh, that's how he made it look like that. No, I don't really think I have anything. I don't want to sound like a know-it-all either. You're just going to insert that you know to like, all. I'm a know-it-all. That's I'm right. Know -all. You fucker. And then I'll make you create the loop for that to go over. It's just going to be fart sounds, you know it. I'm a at all. All right, we're out. We rate this frame good. Should we be rating the movies? I feel like the whole podcast is a a deep nuanced rating, right? Uh, no, I, no? I, I don't think it's, do you think we should be boiling it down to like a plus or eight out no, of 10? I don't. Cause that's, I think that's disrespectful to the, like, well, let's I have just, a real conversation we're just about rating it, right? things we like. And we don't like, I don't know. I guess rating is a term that you has now been, uh Oh, Jen was right. It's a bad name. No, it's just been <laughs> co-opted by like, give it how many stars. Cause it's a, you rate it. Right. But, but we're just can saying mean like or dislike. Thumbs up, thumb down. It. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Critical. I would just cut this out. This has been a small beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The beans always have new ideas percolating. So make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash small beans. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash small beans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge giant monster beans. 
If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!